Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the producer behind these live stream events. Every week, we're bringing Nightlife Programming to you at home with virtual nightlife and night school. Tonight's night school is epidemics and ecosystems. And we've very, invited some very special guests here tonight uh, to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, but not about what you've been reading in the news for the past several months necessarily. Um, but here to intro each other are Dr. Shannon Bennett and Dr. Peter Rootmarin. Peter, want to take it away? Sure. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shannon Bennett. Shannon is the chief scientist of the California Academy of Sciences, and she's also the dean of the Institute of Biodiversity Sciences and Sustainability, essentially the research arm of the academy. Shannon is a microbiologist who has uh, many interesting skills. I think the most relevant one tonight is that she is a virologist and she studies, she works on emerging diseases, diseases that, that come from, stem from the natural world and enter the human world. And so she is an excellent person to listen to tonight. So I'll turn it over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm really excited to share this space with you and um, present the audience with our research together. Peter is a, a, a full curator of geology, and you wouldn't expect a geologist and a microbiologist to have maybe much to talk about together in the same forum, but actually this is the perfect uh, coming together of our two disciplines. Uh, Peter has a rich history of looking at through the fossil record at complex networks of interacting organisms and understanding how they uh, dynamically respond to changing environments and changing landscapes and what better a uh, way to approach this emerging infectious disease that's sweeping us. Uh, and humans were existing as networks and these networks are sharing viruses across different scales. So I'm really excited to, to share tonight's forum with you, Peter. Same here. And as a reminder, tonight's program is live, so please feel free to ask questions for Shannon and Peter um, and share any comments you have. Um, I think that's it for us. Shannon, take it away. All right. Okay, so I am going to start off by, uh, so if everybody can see my talk, I crossed out the word epidemics because this was going to be alliteratively epidemics and ecosystems, but really we're really facing a pandemic. And I want to talk about uh, the pandemic that's being caused by this novel coronavirus. So um, as Peter mentioned, I'm really focused on the evolution of emerging infectious viruses that come out of natural systems. I have been studying how a virus diversity in nature can really take advantage of new opportunities and changing human ecosystems to capture the human host and emerge into human populations in the short term and the long term. And I put up this slide to show some of the very um, interesting sort of top of our minds, infectious diseases that emerged from natural systems. So many, many uh, long-term and short-term pathogens we've had to face have come from natural systems. And uh, HIV is an example of something that emerged from non-human primates. Uh, influenza emerges from birds. Hantavirus is, a, is pinging humans, but hasn't fully emerged into humans, and that's uh, from small mammals. Uh, I've worked on Zika, dengue, and other mosquito-borne viruses. So mosquitoes are excellent bridge vectors to help facilitate host jumping and viruses. And of course, top of mind are all the bat viruses that um, novel coronavirus is one of. So Nipah, Hendra, Ebola, some of the most famous ones. And this is a horseshoe bat from my colleague, uh, Gary Williams, who taken in South Africa, and the source of many viruses that jump from uh, natural systems into humans. But what I really wanna focus on today is uh, the novel coronavirus, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it is, where it came from, and where it's going. Uh, and some of the techniques that uh, I use to address these questions are similar techniques that I've used to answer similar questions for other emerging infectious diseases. And as I said, most of my work has been done on vector-borne viruses. And we study dengue, Zika, chikungunya, which is another fascinating virus that emerged in 2013 in the Caribbean. And we used genetic techniques 
to map the changes that the viruses undergo when they move from natural sh systems shown here in pink, in the pink boxes, and these are the family trees of these viruses. When they move from those pink uh, uh, samples in natural hosts into the human hosts, and those are all the ones shown in black. And we can use similar techniques, sort of, it's like CSI for viruses. We uncover the genetic information, which kind of holds the secrets to not only their origins in, in deep time, but also in ecological time. And it also tells us how they're changing now that they've sort of gotten into the human population. So we use similar techniques for the novel coronavirus. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about what it is. So the Novel coronavirus, uh, which emerged late in 2019 from China, is in a group of viruses called the coronaviruses, and they're named for the crown-like look that they have that, they're, that is conferred by the spike proteins that are nestled into the um, lipid or fatty membrane that coats and encapsulates the virus's genetic material. And you can see it in this, uh, this uh, image where you can see the red spike proteins are sticking up out of the virus. And these are really critical for binding with the host uh, cell receptors. They are very specific to different kinds of receptors. They're the, the key to the lock that allows them to enter the door of the host cell and basically set up shop, have a party and start replicating. So it's in a group of other viruses that include some famous uh, viruses. SARS-1 is in the same group, uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Vi uh, Syndrome virus. And there's a whole suite of actual human coronaviruses that have emerged into humans over the last hundred years uh, that are in this family also. And they cause common cold like sy symptoms. The whole family uh, is very much uh, very nimble in terms of the kinds of hosts that they infect. So all of them originate in bats, but they can sometimes jump into other kinds of bridge hosts like palm civets in the case of SARS, camels in the case of MERS, and in humans, in the human coronaviruses. So I wanted to clear up some of the naming conventions because when we when this first emerged, it was just called the novel coronavirus. And then as genetic information became uh, available and uh, family tree analyses, which we called phylogenetics, placed it in a related situation with SARS, it was renamed SARS-CoV-2. And that stands for uh, SARS Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Number Two. Uh, since the first one, SARS coronavirus was number one. The disease is what folks are calling COVID-19. So the official name of the actual disease is COVID. That's kind of a similar naming system, common in virology, HIV, is the virus and AIDS is the disease. And they're not always the same thing. And sometimes you can have the virus and not have the disease. And that's what's adding to the complication of this virus. So here's a family tree of these viruses, the coronaviruses. These are fairly uh, rich genomes. They're uh, almost 30,000 base pairs long. So that's pretty big for a virus. They have about 10 genes and they change at a nice clock-like rate of about one to three changes per month across the entire genome. Uh, it's a single-stranded RNA virus, which basically when I mentioned it uses this key to open the lock of the host cell receptor, get into the host cell and set up shop. This virus, because it's already starting as in a, in a form, the RNA form, it can directly translate its genetic information into proteins and start making copies of, the, uh, of itself and bud off of the host cell and sort of start infecting other cells in the body. So it kind of skips a whole step from DNA-based viruses and other organisms like ourselves, which have to go from DNA to RNA to protein. This sort of gets right going from RNA to protein. And you can see from the family tree, I've highlighted in color some of the famous members of this group that I talked about before. In red, we have SARS-CoV-2 right at the top of the family tree. It's mostly closely related to a form of virus that re was recovered in bats. And these are, there's a bunch of bat viruses that have actually been, been recovered, ancillary to even knowing about SARS-CoV-2, sort of under different auspices and different studies. So it suggests that there's a wide diversity of similarly related viruses out there in bats uh, that have been out there through time. Uh, bef well before this emergence of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in purple, 
is SARS-CoV-1. It's about 80% on average related to SARS-CoV-2. And then in fuchsia is MERS-CoV. So this is uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. And then um, a little more distantly related are, are the seasonal human coronaviruses. So they're shown in green. And like I said, this is a virus, a group of viruses that has been pinging humans probably for a long time. And in the in at least over the last hundred years has made a successful leap into humans and set up shop as a, one of the causes of the common cold. And that's the human coronaviruses. Uh, I also have in turquoise some viruses that were also collected from pangolins. Uh, again, independent of, of knowing about SARS-CoV-2, these are other kinds of studies called metagenomic studies. And when these were deposited in public repertoires, uh, public databases, they, they were pulled out when, we, when family tree analysis was done. That doesn't mean that it's the br known bridge, vect uh, bridge host the way uh, SARS-CoV-1 was identified in palm civets. So this is just sort of anecdotal data that shows that there are other sequences out there in other mammals that are very related to this virus. But bat is the origin host. That's the take home message. So one of the things we like to do is say, okay, it's leaped into humans. What changed to enable that leap? And not only the leap into humans, but then it's ongoing spread human to human. Because with a lot of emerging infectious diseases, you may have um, introductions into humans over and over again, so animal to human transmission, but what does it take to set up efficient human to human transmission? And it turns out that some of the changes in the virus uh, that allowed this to happen, we suspect, are located in that spike protein I told you about. So in this diagram, we have um, the spike proteins modeled in gray, and the human host, the cell receptor, which is called ACE2, modeled in turquoise. And the turquoise is binding to the gray. And then we have two copies of gray. We have a gray version from SARS-1, and it's being compared to the human coronavirus, and the differences are being highlighted in, highlighted in red. There's a lot of differences. Remember, this is on average 80% different. The rat, uh, the bat virus, which is named RATG13, has many, many more similarities to the human coronavirus 19, but it does have a few changes, and those are localized in red right at the binding site to the host cell receptor. So this suggests that the bat virus was much more closely related to the human coronavirus but had to, than original SARS, but had to go through some tweaks to allow it to efficiently bind to the human host cell receptor. There's been some other changes that have been identified uh, called furin cleavage sites, which help the conformational change of the spike protein once it binds to the human host cell receptor. And these are deep internal to the spike protein. And these are shown on the right. And they're also probably important for allowing this virus to transition and set up sort of a permanent uh, pandemic potential in humans. So it emerged in Wuhan, China. The origins uh, are, are, are localized, were localized to this wet market. Uh, the graphic below shows sort of a trace of the case counts as time played out, starting with some original um, uh, cases associated back as early as the beginning of December 1st, but it was not known uh, then. It was not recognized as a different agent. It was a pneumonia symptom with an, uh, syndrome with unknown agents. And then it slowly wasn't even really recognized as a human-to-human -human transmission event until much later. At this point, looking at this graph, um, health professionals assumed that this was repeated animal-to-human transmission happening through the wet market. And it was only later that by, even by late December, it was realized um, that by late December, efficient human to human transmission had already evolved before it had even hit our radar. So the shape of this curve, sort of the way case counts begin and then grow and then diminish is what we call an epidemic wave. And so I wanted to show a figure here that shows a classic pattern of an epidemic wave. And, and it's taken from a draft of a WikiHow that I've been collaborating with Wiki on. And so it's not yet out, but it would it's going to tell a similar story. Basically, when the cases first start to grow, um, we see a classic pattern as we're recording cases where they glow slow. 
uh, uh, slowly at first, but then they ramp up and begin to grow exponentially. And then in a perfectly ideal situation, the rate of that growth, we assign this value R naught. And that's basically the reproductive number of the virus. It's reflected in how many infections arise on average from a single infected individual. And if that value is over one, then this epidemic is gonna grow exponentially at a factor equivalent to that 2.5 value. And so you can see early on in the epidemic, there's this sort of exponential growth. Now this is in an ideal world. This is where there's infinite numbers of susceptibles or it's, a, it's not limiting the virus and the pathogen has this opportunity to sort of just grow. So R not kind of thinking of it as its initial growth potential. And um, in the case of this virus, it's coming in at about 2.5. It's sort of primary growth potential. However, we're doing everything we can to limit the number of susceptibles, the number of people that we might pass the virus on to or put ourselves at danger as, as being susceptible. So we're really trying to change that dynamic. And when populations or societies do that through some kind of an intervention, whether it's through a vaccination program or through a shelter in place mitigation, we call that the effect of R. And what we're really trying to do is drive that effect of R, that reproductive number of the virus to below one. And when that happens, the epidemic curve bends, the wave passes and the number of cases drops. So a lot of these um, estimates of the reproductive number of the virus is really derived from what we call SIR models or susceptible infected recovered models, where we track the number of susceptibles that convert to infected, convert to recovered, and then at some point, if immunity wanes, those recovered might get graduated back into the susceptible bucket. But what we're really trying to do now is reduce the number of effective susceptibles to try to bend the curve of this epidemic wave. And when we look at some of the China data, this is exactly what they were doing early on in the epidemic. You can see that classic epidemic wave where early through uh, December, January, mounting to late January, there was exponential growth. But then by mid to late January, there were many, many interventions. Uh, lockdown began uh, late in January. And then once that happened, it really turned the epidemic curve. So what they essentially did was taking, they were taking susceptibles out of that bucket and removing the ability for the virus to grow. So uh, I wanted to just do, give you a little snapshot of what SARS-CoV-2 looks like relative to some other famous viruses we know about. So SARS-CoV-2 is coming in at about 2.5, 2.6 for its reproductive number, um, but there's quite a range. It, these are often gained retro respectively, and there's a lot of variation. And uh, compared to some of the others, like measles, it's not so bad. But then uh, uh, compared to something like um, even uh, say seasonal influenza, it's much more transmissible with influenzas in there at about 0.9 to 1.8. So um, this is a highly transmissible virus. And when we put it on a chart and compare on the bottom, the, the reproductive number, the number of people that are infected by an infected person against its mortality rate, the estimates are right in the pink box for this novel coronavirus. And you can see that it is both, um, it's less serious than SARS, uh, and MERS and Ebola, so that's a good thing in terms of mortality rate, but it's certainly on the uh, highly transmissible side relative to SARS and MERS and Ebola and other things. So I wanted to give you a snapshot of what's happening in terms of the epidemic wave and ask the question, is it passing? Well, we know here in the US, it ain't passing, unfortunately. And so this graphic shows you several countries of interest. Um, on the top are the cumulative case, case, case curves, and on the bottom are the daily new case curves. So the epidemic wave is a lens that's applied to the rate of change in the daily new uh, cases. So look to the bottom side uh, panel and you'll see the traces that are supposed to mimic that epidemic wave of building up and then going back down. Unfortunately, in very few cases, is it gone up and then gone back down. Uh, to in, in China and South Korea, there's been success in, in the cases building up exponentially at first very rapidly, reaching a peak and then sort of turning the bend. But you can see even in places where 
um, mitigations of removing the susceptibles out of the population through shelter in place, through quarantining and contact tracing, uh, even still, this virus is hovering, it's out there. And that really tells the story of what's happened in the US. In the US, you can see looking at the bottom that the number of new cases ramped up exponentially. It hit a, a leveling off. It started to bend and go down, but we in many cases either released shelter in place or had um, maybe not so good compliance with shelter in place and the virus popped right back up again. And in case, and, in actual fact, we're going through another surge. Uh, in other places like Italy and Germany, they have definitely managed to bend the curve and the epi epidemic wave is, is passing by and large, but it, there's still a lot of virus out there ready to sort of just like a spark, if there's enough susceptible tinder, start another wildfire. Uh, here in California, we're in a similar situation where we had exponential growth, looked like we were bending the epidemic wave, bending the curve, but now we're on a, a slow growth trajectory. Uh, and then we have some famous states that have um, uh, are in the real thick of things like Florida and Louisiana and Arizona. And then of course in New York, they uh, had very severe uh, exponential growth uh, it was very dire, and then, but it uh, luckily um, it it uh, it bent. So they've they've flattened their curve, uh, or at least they've seen the passage of the wave. So just to rem to remind everybody, one of the major biological features of this virus that is contributing to that fairly high or not. And the shape of that epidemic wave is the variety of ways it can transmit, and particularly that it really appears to be able to transmit in large as well as small aerosolized droplets. And the other really scary factor about this virus is that almost uh, more than 50% of all transmission events are occurring between people that are either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, and they're circulating in the population, and they don't even know it, right? So one of the things that's really exciting to me is that I get to look at the genetic information underlying the virus dynamics. And um, it's an amazing time to be a scientist and to study genetic information because of the uh, great degree of sharing and crowdsourcing of genetic information. And so this is a tree, it's publicly available. You can go and explore it, pull it up for party tricks. Uh, it's really fascinating. And you can look at the structure of the virus, not only when it emerged, and that's shown in this family tree in the blue blue samples from Southeast Asia very early on in January along the bottom of the graph. And then you can see how it's been changing and evolving. So it adapted to the human um, cell, uh, you know, cell receptor and efficient human to human transmission, but it didn't stop there. This virus has continued to evolve and there are several major lineages that have, have shown up. And the one that everybody's watching with great um, attentiveness, including our, our lab is 20C. So 20C is a common lineage that's uh, common in the US shown in red. Um, and it has a, a mutation called uh, the six, uh, the, the D614G mutation. And that mutation is actually correlated with um, growing dominance of that strain in populations. And so folks are trying to decide and do this, the test to support whether this mutation it actually confers fitness to this virus and makes it more transmissible. So this is what the genetic um, family tree of this mutation looks like and you can see uh, on the um, on the on the left hand side it actually changes like the furin cleavage site some of the internal dynamics of the spike protein and then on the right hand side you can see that the family tree of this virus all of the G mutations are shown in the yellow band and they're becoming more diverse and more common as a group of viruses. So I just wanted to invite everybody, as I said, this is a really fascinating time to be a scientist because the open sourcing, the crowdsourcing of an incredible amount of data is basically available at all our finger trips. Tips. And that includes uh, mapping programs like the John Hopkins site, the Worldometer, which is kind of a really fun dashboard I'm showing in the graphic, um, 
One of my favorites is the New York Times vaccine tracker. It gives me great hope as I watch which vaccines are coming in the pipeline. There's over 130 uh, vaccines that are in some kind of status in terms of being evaluated for this virus. And then you can download in real time all of the genetic information of this virus in the next train or GSAD interfaces. So um, with that, I'd just like to close by saying and reminding everybody that the CDC and the WHO are continuing to hone in on guidelines, and those include that you must stay at home if you're sick, but even if you're not sick, because this virus is so very uh, transmissible even before people are symptomatic. Uh, and for those reasons, we need to maintain social distancing and wear a mask whether or not we feel sick. Uh, we'll also wash our hands. Uh, and this graphic just shows that at the beginning, we thought it wasn't very aerosolized, but now we're not so sure. It looks like it can actually maybe float a little bit further than the six feet folks really uh, originally thought. So with that, I will thank you and take any questions. Okay, great. Can you all hear me? Yep, there I am. Um, yeah, there's some really interesting questions here, Shannon. Um, I'll sure. Let's go through them in order. First one is from Hannah. And it says, are certain wild animals like bats and birds more likely to carry these diseases or are all animals capable of spreading disease? Um, so, so influenza is one of the classic zoonotic diseases and it's just, it, it, it evolved in birds. It's just originally a bird virus. And the reason that it's so good at jumping into new hosts, and particularly it can jump into many bird species, other bird species, it can jump into pigs, and it can jump into humans, is because it has a different genetic architecture that influenza is sectioned into segments, kind of like our chromosomes, and it can reshuffle and recombine those segments. And often that confers ability to jump into new hosts. So the um, H1 N1 swine flu pandemic back in 2009 was a recombinant virus that had reassorted itself in a pig uh, incubation chamber, so to speak, and then it jumped into agricultural workers. So, so that's a kind of a different biological feature. Bats are implicated in a lot of zoonotic viral infections because um, we, well, we don't really know, but bats harbor a lot of viruses and a large, large viral diversity. And one hypothesis that is, uh, you know, out there and, and is probably hard to verify is that uh, bats are the only mammals capable of sustained flight. So it, it's possible that um, running kind of at a fever pitch uh, on a day-to-day -day basis has made them somehow a good good hosts for a large diversity of viruses. Good hosts in that they themselves are not really harmed. They're sort of regulating the viruses that are in their system through the fever defense that they can manage all the time. Uh, people used to think, oh, maybe it's because they've evolved a different immune system and whole genome sequences of bat bats suggest that's not true. And other people used to, um, one, another hypothesis was that maybe they were, um, uh, colony dwellers. So they really, those tight packing of cave bats really help to uh, facilitate transmission. But it turns out that solitary bats also have a high diversity of viruses. So lots to discover. If anybody wants to become a bat virologist, <laughs> have a lot to do. <laughs> okay. Great answer. Um, so I'll ask this one because, of course, this question comes up over and over again. I've been asked, could a virus like this novel coronavirus possibly be man-made, be artificial? Right. Um, so one of the things I, I didn't um, show folks is the, um, the you know, the website uh, for nextstrain.org actually gives you a really nice picture of how, um, how this virus uh, demonstrates uh, diversity across its entire genome. And although we focus a lot in our uh, in investigations on the mutations of the spike protein, because it is so very critical at binding to the host cell receptor, there are um, a great deal of mutations, uh, substitutions scattered throughout the entire genome uh, that are distributed in a way and accrue at, the, at, at a rate that 
you would expect to see in nature. It, in that family tree that I showed you, it looks very much like, and with 30,000 bases to choose from, it looks very much like it's in the context uh, that it should be in for it to, uh, to be a naturally occurring virus. Uh, I, uh, you know, I've I've been um, working on recombinant dengue viruses in the past, and believe me, even just engineering one or two or three or four sites is at the very limit of our technological know-how for engineering a virus. So there's no evidence that it's engineered. And I don't know if can, I tried to show the the um, the screen. Can people see my screen? Does that work? Or yep. Yeah. So. So you can see that this is a, a scan of the genome, with, which shows the mu kinds of mutations and where they are across the genome. And the spike protein is here in green. And sure, it's got a lot of mutations, but there are abundant mutations scattered across the genome and mapping to places that you see in nature. Okay, good answer. And then maybe Final one here, this one is from Valerie. What measures can humans take to prevent that initial jump from another species to us? That's a really great question. And I actually just wrote a, a biographic article for the Cal Academy's yep. biographic magazine speculating a little bit more about this. But there is no question that um, there are an abundant diversity of viruses in nature and they've been there of all, since the origins of life. What is it that drives those viruses into human populations? The primary factor is when humans and uh, natural systems come in contact with each other. Uh, sometimes it's through the facilitation of an invasive species like a, a certain species of mosquitoes or rats, depending. Um, but but um, the, the way that humans uh, sort of interact with the natural world is usually one of a, a really impactful landscape degradation and, and perturbation of sort of a, the natural biodiversity of the system. So uh, in, the, you know, in the case of, of those Nipah and Hendra viruses I mentioned, the, the, these were big agricultural uh, efforts that sort of drove bats into uh, pig farm orchard situations where human workers came in contact with, with um, viruses that would never normally come emerge from natural systems. Systems. And uh, the highly pathogenic avian influenza emerged from natural migratory birds into big ag of, um, you know, fowl, chicken, and, and duck farming. Um, a lot of sources of viruses come from um, HIV evolved from, basically jumped into humans from a, a simian form, primate form, uh, through bushmeat hunting. So uh, uh, humans going into natural systems um, feeding on or even harvesting sick animals and then bringing viruses into human communities and large population centers like the last Ebola outbreak of 2013. Um, of course, in those situations, uh, there's food insecurity that's driving a lot of those dynamics. So whether it's big egg or food insecurity, and in this case, and in the case of SARS-1, it was um, a, the cultural practice of, of, of eating wildlife that brought uh, wildlife into uh, contact with humans out of natural systems. So there are many different kinds of drivers. And I think looking at how we uh, relate to nature and how we perturb it on broad scales um, to sort of change the distribution of biodiversity and, and paint a big target of opportunity on, on humans and the associated invasive species that hang out with humans is part of the problem. Yeah. Okay. And let's see, there is, yes, there's one more here. Given the similarities between SARS and COVID-19, why did they each have such drastically different spread patterns? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. And so if you look at the r naught numbers, it's not so different, right? They're kind of in the same order of magnitude, but with SARS, um, SARS only transmitted, it was only, an infected person was only capable of transmitting SARS up to five, at least five days, four to five days after they were symptomatic. And so what that meant was that people with SARS were able to be isolated and quarantined and um, 
there was a very effective reduction in the in the susceptible population because you could quarantine and isolate infecteds before they could transmit. With SARS with SARS CoV two, because uh, transmission is possible from asymptomatic or pre symptomatic people, it's really hard to to stop transmission events and to isolate infecteds from susceptibles in a population where those infecteds are just wandering around willy nilly. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I think now we get to pass it on to Peter. And I'll just wait for my slides to come up here. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to uh, follow on some of what Shannon talked about, especially in the answering session, and talk a little bit about ecosystems and biodiversity, but not so much about how we uh, discover, dis unfortunately, discover diseases in natural ecosystems, but what natural ecosystems might tell us about the impacts that the pandemic are having on other systems that are important to us, uh, notably our sociological and economic systems. So, sorry here. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very, very quick introduction to the types of systems that I'll be talking about tonight, and we generally refer to them as complex adaptive systems. And to be a complex adaptive system, you have to have certain features. One is it's a system made up of multiple individuals. Those, in, those individuals or entities might be independent or semi-independent, but they're all interacting. And when they interact, it's, they're exchanging or flowing material. So it can be energy flowing through a power grid. It could be information flowing through the World Wide Web. It could be viruses moving through a human population or it could be energy moving through an ecosystem as different species of organisms interact with each other. There's also structure in the system or network in that not um, everybody interacts with everybody else. But if you think of a human society, for example, as a complex adaptive system, there are groupings or subsystems within a human society, subsocieties. Your family group, for example, you interact with your family, you interact probably with coworkers more frequently than you do with all of the other members of your society in general. And this one is very, very, the last two are really important. First, the interactions tend to be nonlinear. And what does that mean? Simply put, it means that let's say I'm adding something to the system or I'm changing something in the system and I do it by a specified amount each time. As I increase that, adding one spoonful after the next, the response that I get is not necessarily moving in concert with what I'm adding. So adding one teaspoon, I get an effect. Two teaspoons, I double that effect. Three teaspoons might not triple the effect. It might quadruple it or more. There's that exponential growth that Shannon was referring to. That's a nonlinear uh, type of response. And because of that, these systems can harbor surprises for us. And then finally, these systems are path dependent. So what you have today, the ecosystems that we have today, the human societies that we have today, depend very much on what they were yesterday, what they were, they were in the past. So there's a memory built into the system. They evolve, they develop. Okay, so why is all of this important or at least interesting? Well, I think right now one of the things we're struggling with is that we have a perfect storm of a collision of a number of these types of systems that are important to us. On the left, this really fancy, whoops, colorful diagram ah, here is the food web of a tropical coral reef. This one, a coral reef ecosystem from Jamaica. And what we're looking at here, are all of the species within that system and all the fancy little lines are how they're interacting with each other. On the right, this is another type of network. In this case, we're looking at industries belonging to many of the world's major economies. And there are many different components to those industries, many types of businesses and so on. And they're all interacting with each other, both within their own nation states and between nation states. And then up here in the middle, this is a map from the early days or the very early days of the spread of COVID-19. You can see at that time, hotspots around the globe were places like China, primarily our Wuhan, but a few other places in China, Seattle, Germany, and France. 
And because this is early, this is probably sometime in around mid-February, late February, we haven't even really arrived at the hot spots that have been taxing our systems like New York, Northern Italy, Spain, Brazil, um, and of course, the other states within the US that are now hotspots. So it's this perfect storm of these systems coming together. Okay, so what's so interesting about this? Well, first I'm going to tell you what my work with looking at ecosystems as complex systems has taught us and why it's led me to ask questions about some of our human systems under the current stress of the pandemic to see if there are any similarities and if there are any lessons that we're able to learn from how natural systems, ecosystems behave or the ways in which we study them. So here's a closer view of this coral reef ecosystem from Jamaica. And it's a very, very busy type of network. If you look around here at the edge, all these tiny little circles, those are individual species. And the lines in between are predator-prey interactions that are taking place every day on one of these reefs. So you can think of this as a human society or an economy. There's a lot of activity, a lot of individuals exchanging and interacting. On the right, each one of these chains here is an example of a food chain that's drawn from one of the four colors that we've added to this network. And these are our sub-communities. And so when we look at this network with about 750 species in it and all of these interactions, it's not a random assortment of species. It's not a random assortment of interactions, but there's a lot of structure to it. Species tend to be aggregated into these functional groups and these modules that interact more frequently with each other. Now, what do I do with this sort of thing? Well, one of the things that I've been interested in for a number of years is understanding how ecosystems respond when they're subjected to extreme stress, because that, of course, is uh, very important to us and of great interest as we head into a future with a deteriorating climate for our modern ecosystems and stronger and stronger human or anthropogenic impacts on those ecosystems. And to understand how a complex system really works, one of the best things to do is to study that system under stress. We don't have the advantage of having seen ecosystems be put under extreme stress in our uh, history as humans so far, or our recorded history, our history of science. But in the ancient past, ecosystems have certainly been stressed. And what we're looking at here is a measure of marine biodiversity over the last 540 million years. If we just follow this blue curve, we can see biodiversity has expanded. In the past, it's plateaued and it's contracted. And there are times of really significant contractions marked by these dashed lines here. Those are mass extinctions and there've been five big ones. We call them the big five. And what I've been doing for a number of years is I've been studying, we'll go back here, this one right here, the Permo-Triassic, we call the mother of all mass extinctions. At this time, about 80% of species in the oceans, 250 million years ago, went extinct in a geologically and evolutionarily very short period of time. About 70% of species on land went extinct. The cause, the ultimate driver was, if we look at this map here, it's a map of Russia and this area that's outlined in these beautiful colors. This is what we refer to as the Siberian traps. And a little over 251 million years ago, Siberia sort of opened up. There's an upwelling of magma from inside the earth and there's a tremendous amount of volcanic activity that occurs in several phases. The first phase that lasted a couple of thousand years was a lot of explosive volcanism that drove a certain amount of climate change. The next phase was another upwelling of magma that burned through subsurface layers of buried fossil fuels that essentially drove really dramatic climate change in a short period of time, very similar to what we're experiencing today. The resulting alter alterations to the planet led to a world where you had this massive extinction. In the lower photo here, you can't see this really well, but this is a fossil from just before the extinction, a marine fossil. And we're up in the mountains of Hubei, China, just several hours drive from Wuhan, actually, when we did this field work. And shown right here is a cross-section 
of the shell of an animal that was related to octopus and squid and was super abundant, very diverse in the oceans at the time. If we fast forward just a million years or so, the rock record at that time is virtually empty of fossils. Life is still around, but it's very difficult to find. It's very scarce. And what we're excited about here in this photo, you can't even see them, but they're really minute little squiggles on the rock that shows us that there are animals that were beginning, the ecosystem was recovering, and there are small animals that were beginning to move about on the sediment and feed again. But to get these traces, there's a lag of um, almost a million years. Okay, so I'm going to mention before I get to the real meat of this, just very quickly what we've learned from this. What we're looking at here are reconstructions and a fossil from a 251 million year old forest ecosystem from Southern Africa. It's an extremely well-preserved ecosystem. We've sampled it for about 13 million years prior to the mass extinction. It was rich, it was diverse, it worked really well. And we're able to document this well-functioning eco ecosystem. We're able to look at it as it transited through the mass extinction and we can examine it. We've been able to examine it for several million years afterwards. And this is the kind of picture that emerges. On the left, this is a bit of a cartoon food web of our forest ecosystem before the mass extinction. In the circles here, with the cool little cartoon pictures, these show groups of animals that are performing similar functions in the ecosystem. So you can think of this as businesses or job occupations in the human economy, for example. It's diverse. There are lots of species in each one of these uh, bubbles, if you will, and they're all interacting with each other. On the right is the ecosystem that arose within a million years of the really big crunch of that mass extinction. Both of these systems are almost equal in species diversity. They're also almost equal in functional diversity, and that's a measure of how many different types of things are the organisms in, this, in these systems doing? How many different types of plants, trees versus shrubs? How many large carnivores, small carnivores? How many large herbivores do we have? Plant-eating insects and so on. So they're almost equal in that sense also. However, if we examine how these systems functioned, the system on the left was a very, very stable ecosystem. The system on the right was a highly unstable one and would have responded dramatically to minor disturbances such as having a severe drought one year. Prior to the mass extinction, the ecosystem would have, would have weathered these changes. After the mass extinction, things would fall apart and they probably did on a fairly regular basis. To recover the stability that we had prior to the mass extinction took at least seven million years. So, what is it that happened there and what do we learn from this? Well, first of all, the first thing we know is that the more diverse the functions, the more sorts of job occupations that you have within any ecosystem, the more stable it is. However, some of these functional structures, even if they're just as complicated, just as complex, some of the arrangements of those occupations or functions lead to significantly greater stability than others. And that greater stability comes from the fact that you have systems that have deep histories. The species in those systems, the functional groups, have co-evolved together over evolutionary time. And there's been this fine tuning of how the system works. And once you lose it, it takes time to recover it again. So the question that we've been asking with regard to COVID-19 is we've pivoted from working on these ecosystems to ask if we, understanding that human complex systems bear many of the same features as ecosystems, for example, which features, if any, of our modern complex human societies might determine how stable we are under pandemic conditions, how resilient or how vulnerable our societies might be. And in order to do this, right, we've, we've had to develop an entire new framework of thinking and operating. And I'm going to show you what we've been developing, sort of introduce you to it very briefly. And then I'm going to give you some results that we've generated. Um, well, preliminary results came out last week and there was a whole slew of, of correcting activity this weekend. So I'm gonna show you stuff that 
results that I've been generating between Tuesday and about two hours ago. So when, when I made the last slide for this. Okay, so the system that we're going to be looking at is a socioeconomic system. So shown here in this network, these are different industries, sub-industries, businesses, and so on, the types of economic activities that take place within a modern developed Western economy. Okay, so this one could represent uh, many different types of economies within Europe, the European Union, the UK, or somewhere in the United States. The drivers, so when I showed you the ecosystem, right, the driver of change for that ecosystem was a massive Siberian volcanism 251 million years ago. The drivers of change or impact in our human socioeconomic system are going to be twofold. One, there's a health emergency. And there again is that view of the COVID-19 causing virus, the SARS-2 virus. However, in responding or attempting to respond to the health emergency, knowing that we have a limited capacity to deal with this disease right now, with a lack of vaccines, lack of effective treatments, a shortened duration and so on, we've also put in place certain measures to disrupt or limit the transmission of the disease. This is a lot of what Shannon was talking about, with things like shelter in place orders, lockdowns, shutdowns, and in so doing, we have essentially precipitated an economic emergency that I think everybody right now is, uh, is, a, is aware of, right? We're struggling economically across the globe because of what we've had to do to manage the disease. The measure that we're going to apply of how, what have been the effects of these two drivers, the drivers of mortality from the disease, the driver of illness from the disease, the driver of the impact on the economy of trying to limit the disease through shelter in place and shutdowns. The measurement that we're going to use is employment within our human systems. And shown on the left is the last, well, since 1940, the uh, monthly job gains or losses in the United States. Gains wriggling above the top in blue, losses in red. And there've been a few notable events until recently, demobilization in World War, World War II, suddenly have a lot of people who no longer had the jobs they had in the recent past. What we're calling the Great Recession of 2008, right? And we should never name things great, right? Because that's assuming that it's, it's going to be the one. But however, when we look at 2020, that's the red line right here. There's nothing great about 2008. We have blown everything off the scale. We are in essentially uncharted territory in many ways for our socioeconomic system and our socioeconomic system. And right here is a chart from uh, the US Bureau of Economic Analysis that was released last week with the most updated numbers. And here we're looking at the change in GDP, US GDP and the variation uh, over the last four years or so. And you can see where we are right now as of July 17th. And we are, we are in, a, we're in seriously dire straits. Okay. So here's, in a nutshell, what we've been trying to do. We've been taking our socioeconomic systems, and here is one view of industrial, how we divide up a system in the US into industrial sectors. We're looking at the disease dynamics shown here on the right in this cartoon. We're merging those two together, we're colliding them in a mathematical model and this is a page from one of my notebooks. Um, I didn't have the flash on my camera, unfortunately. We're working out this model. And what we're going to try to do is see how well can we capture what's been happening to the economy based on what the disease has been doing what our, and what our response to the disease has been doing. And this is just one view of one human system my one view of the economic system. There are other considerations. And I'm going to show you some results right now for one of the first questions that we've been tackling. And we've been asking, you know, we're, we're, we're balancing, we're walking a tightrope right now, right? Where on the one hand, we're taking measures to deal with the health emergency. We want to flatten these curves, 
right? We, by social distancing, social isolation, wearing masks, breaking the chain of transmission. On the other hand, we're balancing the fact that we have, we have torched the economy out of necessity, but these questions keep coming up. Is, has it been worth it? Should we continue to do this? I have my, my own opinions that yes, we've, we've had very little, very little choice of how to manage this. And an interesting assumption that's made sometimes in the arguments to do things like reopen the economy, we have to undo our, our disease measure, health emergency measures to get the economy starting is an assumption that even if we did nothing, even if we did not put shelter in place orders in place, if we didn't have social distancing and shutting down workplaces, that the disease would have no direct impact on the socioeconomic system. So if we were allowed to go to work, we could at least keep the economy going. But that's an assumption and it's an assumption that we're testing. And so what we've done is we're running the model where we have no shelter in place, no workplace shutdowns, no social restrictions. However, there is still mortality from COVID-19 and there's still job loss because of morbidity caused by the disease. You lose your job because you're hospitalized for two to three weeks or you're permanently disabled or you have a long-term disability even after having recovered from the disease. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply it to one of the large socioeconomic systems in the US and that's the socioeconomic system of Los Angeles. And here's what we're doing. We're running different scenarios of dealing with the disease. And so Shannon talked about the R0 value and we're using just R0 now in a very simple way. We're saying on the left, for example, if we look at this red curve, that's our epidemic wave. This is the epidemic wave we would have of an R0 of about 4.5. And this is the neighborhood that Wuhan was hovering in in January when they locked down the city. Very, very dangerous outbreak. Here we are where we might be, for example, in the US, an R0 of 2.25. And this is just to show you the difference between these two curves. The peak of the infection, the proportion of the population that's infected is lower, the lower the value of R0. Also, that wave peaks much later on, here in about 60 days, here in about 150 days. Okay, and so what we're doing is we're going to run through a whole series of R0 values from 1.0, where we're just hanging in balance, disease is not dying, but it's not growing, all the way to 4.5, where we have a serious outbreak in a city. We take the values, those infected curves, and are translating it into workplace mortality and workplace hospitalization. And even at the peak here, where we have an R of 4.5, it's peaking early in time, and it's peaking really dramatically, we're still estimating that daily losses of workers to mortality, doesn't include hospitalization, is about 0.06%. So these are very low numbers. No comfort to anybody who's dying or losing a family member or who is severely ill. But in terms of the economy, these are very small daily impacts. And here we have 2.5 and 4.5. And to give you an idea of what happens, if we look at the result on number employment levels in Los Angeles that stand um, at around 4.6 million at the beginning of March or stood at that level at the, in early March. If we have an R of 1.5, we're right up here at the very top. It says there's essentially no measurable impact on the economy. If we're at an R of 2.5, it's going to suggest that after about 120 days, which is a time that's elapsed between the beginning of March and when we got those employment or the, the time period covered by our most recent employment figures, we've, we're down to about four, almost 4.4 million. So we've lost 100,000 jobs. If we're running a Wuhan or serious type of outbreak, you can see the economy holds steady and then you go through an exponential decline, okay? And this is driven very much by, by the epidemic curve. And then we begin to level out to about 120 days, somewhere in a neighborhood of about 3.85 million employees. And I just had the figure of where we are in LA right now, but we're not too far from that number. So if we run this,
for all of these values of R0, and we run it for 120 days, we get this little surface that tells us, for example, at low R0 values, as we run for 120 days, there's essentially no change. As we increase the R0, however, the economy goes into a decline. If you ask where we are today, we're about 3.95 million. That's set about right down in here. And so one of the takeaways from this is that what our model is telling us right now is if we did nothing, we would still have a struggling economy. But in the process of doing nothing, we would have an economic emergency and a more severe health emergency that we've averted by putting in place the measures that we've taken. So balancing these two types of emergencies, we think it was the correct thing to do. But then one final note, getting back to our thinking of the ecosystem and the fact that you have substructure and sub-communities, just like we have substructure in our human systems, you said, what if we didn't have the economy structured the way we did? What if we had all of these industrial sectors that ran independently? and didn't depend on each other. And so in that sense, we're asking, what does having an integrated economy do for us? And my intuition told me that this is actually going to make things worse because every impact on one of our industrial sectors will cascade to and amplify the impact in another sector. And so shown here on the right is what we had here, that result saying, so here's the previous result, of the system as it is. And here is if we kind of disassembled the system. They look really similar, right? But let's just essentially subtract these values from this one. Let's see how much, how much better it is. It's actually not better. If we did not have the type of integrated economy that we do have now uh, that we're looking at, if we remove that network structure, what we see here is that, so this is, the real economic structure or socioeconomic system minus our sort of disassembled one, the losses, it would tell us that the employment losses would be somewhere in the neighborhood of, at least for Los Angeles, 10,000 to 40,000 um, additionally lost jobs. And so this is why complex adaptive systems are so neat, completely to me, counterintuitive result. The networking of the system Actually, sectors add support to each other, which when I think about it, makes sense. And so the socioeconomic system that we have, even under the dire stress, is maintaining some of its own integrity through this internal, the way that it's internally clocked. And I'll leave it there, take some questions. Thanks, Peter. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to read them out. Jennifer asks, given that unemployment numbers are already understated because they cease to count people whose benefits expire, are you adjusting your figures and models for that? Excellent question. And the answer is currently no. The reason being that the data are still extremely difficult to, to come by. And if you remember back in May, for example, there was one week when new employment figure, unemployment figures and employment figures were released and we said, wow, the economy has taken a really big bounce back in a positive direction. Then those were revised and it's like, okay, it's not as good as it, as it seemed. And there were all sorts of questions about, well, were these numbers manipulated? And, and, and they weren't, right? There's a huge amount of work that I'm really still beginning to appreciate, huge amount of work that goes into compiling these data and making them available. And so exactly the data that you ask about. So people essentially dropping out of the numbers because they're no longer actively seeking employment, for example, they're no longer on employment benefits is not something that we, we can account for yet. And so we expect these numbers to be adjusted and of course, what it means is that an already disturbing picture is going to be even more disturbing. All right, here's a question from Beth. Are there examples of double emergencies like the health and economic emergencies we're in now impacting ecosystems in the past and what happened to them? Wow, what, what a great question. Um, 
you know, it's difficult for, to, for us to understand what's happened in the past, but let's go back to my favorite mass extinction, the Permian Triassic. The ultimate driver is Siberian volcanism. But the things that actually affect the organisms that affect the ecosystems, let's say we're in the ocean, are things like ocean warming, because we have global warming being driven by the volcanism and global temperatures begin to rise. And just like today, the oceans are absorbing a lot of that heat. And so warming is an issue. Coupled with the warming is we have disruptions at that time of ocean circulation and we have widespread deoxygenation of, in the oceans. We have ocean acidification. And yes, all of these things combine. Again, it's, it's like a perfect storm of drivers. Perhaps you're an organism that is warm adapted. You could weather it. But then you also have to deal with either lowered oxygen and or changing acidity of the ocean, or even worse, even if you're impervious to all of those things, the system around you is collapsing. The ecosystem and your dependencies on those other organisms are all coming together to make it a bad time for you. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, human societies have faced the same thing. And if you look at complex societies that have fallen apart in the past, major ones, we could go to the Roman Empire, for example. Barbarians, might have been the final nail in the coffin for the Roman Empire. But having that coffin built in the first place was a collision of two things. And that's a changing climate that brought along things like cooler temperatures and droughts that made farming less productive and our first recorded pandemic or well understood pandemic came together, brought down the Romans, brought down Chinese dynasties and so on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Julie yeah. asks, yeah. Uh, so Julie asks, will you be able to work with policymakers and other officials to implement some of the learnings from your research? We certainly hope to do so. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm showing you a two hour old result and we're working very hard on this because one of our goals is to be able to provide um, at least insight that might be useful. So for example, to run the types of Thought, thought and modeling experiments that we're running here to ask what if questions to help perhaps uh, choose between to wait or to develop more informed strategies on how to do these sorts of things. So if we did have to go through an entire series of shutdowns again, for example, should we do it as quickly as we did? Should we do it across the board, across the socioeconomic economic board or focus on some industries at least early on. So if you look at LA, one of the really big industries there is leisure and hospitality. Would it be possible, for example, to do a staged shutdown of the economy by removing a big chunk of it that would have an impact on the epidemic wave, but would slow down the collision of these two systems and slow down the cascading economic shock? Because really, the economic shock was driven by how we responded to the announcement of the shutdown, massive layoffs before anybody had lost any money, layoffs in anticipation of economic losses. So can we do these things better? And so, yes, um, definitely one of the goals of what we're doing is to try to provide some sort of tools for the folks who can actually, um, are actually responsible for making the decisions. Yeah, it, make, it makes me think about uh, the dynamics that have played out in places like Italy and mm -hmm. and wonder whether they are maybe socioeconomically more co-evolved than, yeah. than the US. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a great question. And one of our next steps is to begin we're compiling yeah. all of these different systems to basically treat them the way that we've treated LA. Yeah. With, with respect. Okay, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, when you say the networking of the economy is mitigating the extremes of job loss, what would a non-networked economy look like? And can we see this happening in other countries? Yeah, so our non-networked economy, of course, was, was a thought experiment because the networking of the economy is telling us that industrial sectors do a certain amount of trade within themselves. It's like within leisure and hospitality, we have cinemas and film distributors. But of course, a lot of the industrial activity is between sectors. So the health and education sector providing health and education services to everybody else, but relying heavily 
for example, on manufacturing. So we sort of built a false network when we did that to measure the impact. But net socioeconomic systems are networked quite differently in different places. In the US, we have sort of a standard network. But even when the, within the US, imagine LA is a very big and diverse economy, but there are other parts of our country where one of those industrial sectors, say agriculture, might overwhelmingly dominate everything else and where education and health services, for example, might be much smaller. So even where you have the same network structure, um, will the system behave similarly? And yes, of course, when we go to other economic systems, we would expect to see uh, not just uh, differences in the sizes of industrial sectors, but perhaps novel industrial sectors or industrial sectors that are present in some systems such as ours, which is quite diverse, but absent in other systems. And so, yes, I, I think similar things are probably going to take place in, in other systems because of the networking, but the extent to which it can be a benefit, I think is going to be quite variable. Yeah, it's the quantitative and, and qualitative measures of the network that are. Yeah, important. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass it off to our hosts. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, thanks to thanks so much to Shannon and Peter, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Please make sure to follow them on social media to learn more. Uh, next week, we'll be back with another night school. A guide to Celestial Wayfinding with Kalapa Babayan and Emily Peavy. Thank um, you. And great. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> thank, you, Peter. Thank, you. thank you. Good night. Thanks for all the great questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks again for watching and being such a great audience. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel um, so you get notifications when Nightlife and Night School goes live, which is basically every Thursday at 7. Um, yeah. So see you here next week. Is there anything else, Lynn? No, that's it. See you next week. Okay. Thanks everyone. Night.